Inferences for two population means would have the goal of doing either a hypothesis test or a confidence interval to try to investigate the average or typical difference between two populations when you have quantitative data. So there are two overall designs which are possible. These are called independent samples and dependent samples designs. Under independent samples designs, the data values you gather from one sample uh, are unrelated. They're not matched or paired with any of the values from the second sample. It's almost like you have two researchers who go out and collect data from the two groups without ever talking to each other. Now under dependent samples design, which is also often referred to as matched or paired designs, subjects are somehow paired or matched or grouped in some way so that they're similar on certain characteristics, not the one you're measuring, but other things that might influence the outcome. And then measurements are made uh, either multiple times on that person or uh, between the two people that are matched up or the two items that are matched up in terms of the variable that you're interested in. So let's look at some examples of these different types of samples. We're going to start with examples of independent samples designs. So one thing is that sample sizes can be the same or be different under independent samples because you're not matching uh, observations from one group to another. So in this case, the first example, we actually have equal sample sizes. But what we could do is independently select a different sample from each of the two populations of interest. So I could randomly select 35 males and 35 females then measure each of those 70 uh, people's diastolic blood pressures and then use that to test if there's a significant difference in diastolic blood pressure based on sex. So the two populations of interest are really the blood pressures for the males and the blood pressures for the females. You'll notice in this case the two samples were selected from the populations without trying to match based on things like family or personal history in terms of health. Another example is GPA and athletic status. So in this case, again, we're independently selecting a different sample from two different population groups. So I could look at 40 NKU athletes, so go to the rosters of all the, the athletes we have, randomly pick 40, and then 35 non-athletes go to all the other students at NKU and randomly pick 35 other students, uh, and those are just not on NKU uh, athletic teams. And then I could record the GPA for each of those uh, 75 students. So in this case, what I've got are unequal sample sizes. I have 40 athletes and 35 non-athletes, so I don't even have the same number of GPAs in the two samples. Uh, so the two populations of interest, again, are the GPAs for the athletes and the GPAs for the non-athletes. And again, these samples were uh, selected without trying to match based on anything like prior academic performance, maybe in high school, number of hours currently taken, uh, or incoming ACT scores, or anything like that. So we're just comparing GPA without trying to control for anything else. Another example is to randomly form two groups. So another way to use independent samples design is to take one sort of large, larger group or larger sample, like 100 people, and then randomly assign them to two what are called treatment groups or two different samples. Uh, and again, the sample sizes can be the same or they can be different. So for example, I could be testing two drugs and randomly assign uh, either equal numbers, 50 to drug A and 50 to drug B, uh, or I could come up, the first person comes up, I flip a coin, if it lands on heads, they get drug A. If it lands on tails, they get drug B. 
and do that for each person and then I could balance it so that once I got to 50 in one group everybody else went to the other group so I have e equal sample sizes or I could just let the coin flips determine uh, where people actually end up so I could randomly assign it and I may get you know 63 in one group and 37 in the other uh, so you would have to think about whether that's okay or not and and that gets a, a little bit deeper into uh, some nitty-gritty stuff that we're, we're not going to focus on but the idea is you start out with a bigger group like a hundred and you randomly split it into two groups notice again there's no matching based on prior health or income level or anything um, so the the measurement of reactions based on the drug taken uh, it might be time until relief so if we were comparing ibuprofen and acetaminophen we may want to say okay which one uh, relieves a headache more quickly or uh, does one uh, relieve pain better if you have sore muscles for example uh, or it could be something um, like reduction in blood pressure reduction in cholesterol level so you could do this for for really anything that that you're measuring another example from the field of education would be the idea of learning communities okay so you take a sample of 200 incoming students and then you randomly assign them to one of two what are called learning communities now a learning community is just sort of a, a pair or a triplet of classes that the same students take uh, together so if you have uh, you know Bob and and Jane in uh, a learning community then they're going to take the same two or the same three classes together so they'll see each other in the same physical classroom um, and the idea is it helps to sort of build community a little bit lets you get to know some people on campus uh, and the the hope is that it leads to better grades maybe some good study habits and, and things and we hope that this has a positive impact maybe on GPA so we could measure outcome in terms of GPA uh, at least for those courses to determine if one grouping one set of classes seems to work better as a collection than another so it could be something just for example like an English 101 and a psychology 100 versus a sociology 100 and uh, maybe a political science 101 course or something uh, but again there's no matching uh, stated in this case in terms of you know academic preparation for these students we're not looking at whether they're on financial aid or not so there's no matching uh, other than they're just in these two learning communities uh, so they're not matched we're just comparing those two groups now as we switch to examples dealing with dependent or matched or paired observations uh, there are different ways you can do this one thing is you can take multiple measurements on the same person or item okay sort of like a pretest or a post test um, or you can actually try to match people or items based on similar characteristics uh, and we'll, we'll look at some examples of this as we go through but in this first one uh, we're going to look at measuring subjects multiple times okay uh, just two times is, is all we're doing so we're going to apply sort of the the treatment to the same subject just multiple times so we could examine pretest and post-test scores for the same person and do this maybe for 50 students that are taking a course or something and then use this to examine how much a student learned in a class so it's sort of like on day one I give you a final exam in stat 205 and record your score then we go through the course and uh, give you a final exam at the end uh, and grade it and then see how much of a change was made between the pretest and the post-test score uh, and that would be an idea of on average how much do, do students learn regardless of what information they come in with uh, so a student who already knew the material uh, probably is not going to show much improvement or increase in knowledge while a student who hasn't seen the material before and doesn't really know the subject 
would show a much greater increase. So it eliminates something where maybe uh, there's learning taking place, but yet what you're doing is the pretest was given to a student who already knew the material, the post-test was given to a student who didn't, and then that might not show that much learning has taken place, but what happens is when you're doing the pairing, you don't have those comparisons. You're going to match the uh, student who's seen it before with themselves and the student who's never seen in it with themselves. So you really get a, a better gauge of overall how much of an increase in uh, performance are you seeing on between the pretest and the post-test. Again, this is another example where we're measuring the same person or item uh, twice. Okay, so we're going to measure reactions two different times. So we're going to uh, compare two medicines. So for example, um, ibuprofen and acetaminophen. Uh, examine the pair of measurements for several patients. So for each patient, we're going to uh, wait until they have um, you know, a headache, and then we're going to give them one of the two medicines and see how long it takes until their headache subsides. Then the next time they get a headache, we're going to give them uh, the other medicine, the one they didn't get the first time. Okay, and sometimes they may get acetaminophen first. Sometimes they may get ibuprofen first. Now, you don't have to worry about differences in health or lifestyle or things like that because it's the same person measured against themselves. Uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, an active versus a non-active lifestyle among people, all those things are sort of taken into account because you're measuring that person against him or herself. So all those things are accounted for, so hopefully you're getting a really good measurement of uh, just the one medicine versus the other medicine. Another thing is to pair in some way before an experiment is conducted, okay, and then measure differences, um, you know, of, of what, it, what it is that, that you're interested in. So, for example, we could pair patients based on weight and then measure different reactions, maybe to blood pressure medicine, uh, for two types of medicines. So, we have two people who are... Uh, maybe 200 to 210 pounds. Uh, one gets medicine A, one gets medicine B, and we look at how much of a reduction is observed in blood pressure. And then maybe we have a couple of other people. Uh, one is 180 uh, to 185 pounds uh, for each of them. Uh, so one of those people in that weight range gets medicine A, one gets medicine B. Then we have uh, another weight range, maybe 210 to 220 pounds. Uh, one gets medicine A, one gets medicine B, and so on. So then you've got different people taking the medicine, but you're trying to control for the fact that different weights might impact how the body reacts in terms of blood pressure reduction for the medicine. So you're trying to uh, eliminate differences between the pairs of patients and get a better measure of how different just the two medicines are, regardless of some of the other health characteristics. And then another example uh, might be from an educational standpoint. So suppose that we're, we're trying to teach uh, something about maybe fractions or something uh, in elementary school, and what we do is we're going to try to match kids who have similar uh, life experiences and, and life uh, events outside of school which could impact learning uh, and then measure differences between you know which way they were taught to do fractions or something. Uh, so we could match based on socioeconomic status and then assign two types of teaching methods and then measure how much they've learned. So we would give them a test or something on fractions or multiplying or whatever it is. So the children who have more support at home 
and more educational opportunities are matched and one gets method A, one gets method B and then also children uh, from homes where maybe both parents have to work full-time jobs maybe one of them has to work multiple jobs to try to make ends meet uh, they're also matched so uh, the only differences we should see is really how well the teaching methods are doing and all those other factors hopefully are going to be removed from the equation And finally, one other example uh, is where subjects, again, are paired in some way before an experiment is conducted and then measure the differences. So let's say that Dr. Agard and myself both claim to be the better statistics professor. Uh, we don't really have this debate, but it's just sort of fun to pretend. So to, to determine who's better, um, we're going to match students based on incoming ACT math scores. So we're going to find a student with an ACT math score from Dr. Agard's class and one student with an ACT math score of 20 from my class. Uh, and they're going to be a pair. And then we find a student with a, uh, a 19 and a 19, an 18 and an 18, a 22 and a 22. Uh, and we can repeat some of these. We can have maybe... Uh, four or five that have both have 20s, four or five that both have 21s, 22s. If we can find them that have uh, higher scores, we could do that. Uh, and then what we're going to do is taking those pairs, we're going to measure how well they do, maybe on a final exam uh, in a stat cor course. And then what we would be doing is really comparing how well our students retaining the material and demonstrating that knowledge between our two uh, sets of examples and methods of instruction and stuff. So it should eliminate differences based on math ability, uh, at least as measured by the ACT score, uh, from making one of us look better than the other um, if it's really that prior ability rather than our uh, instruction that makes the difference. So what you're going to have to do is be able to read exercises when you're comparing two groups and distinguish between whether this is an independent samples design or a dependent samples design. Now, what I would suggest doing is think about what are the two groups you're comparing, right? Males and females, athletes and non-athletes, Dr. Agard versus Dr. Miller, Right, whatever these two groups are, identify that. Write down what the measurement is that you're recording about each person, right? Is it the GPA? Is it the weight? Is it the time to relief from a headache or whatever? Write down what you're measuring. Then look for another variable, okay? Is there another characteristic that you're uh, making groupings or pairings of between the two groups, right? Incoming ACT scores, okay? And that thing has to change. It can't be the same for everybody in the sample because then you're just defining a more restricted population, right? If you're talking about all business majors, uh, that would not be anything that makes pairs because everybody in the sample would be a business major. If you take a business major and you take an economics major and you take a math major and you take a stat major and you take a sociology major and you take a nursing major okay, from each of the two groups, then you're creating pairs because the major is changing. It's got to be a variable that you're matching on. It's got to change. Okay? Um, but once you determine whether the design is independent or dependent samples, the remaining work should be a lot more straightforward. Um, actually, for dependent samples design, what we would do is line our data up and sort of in two columns or two rows, and then actually take the differences. So we're going to subtract the, the number in each pair, and then that remaining list of one column of numbers we would really apply all the math that we just learned in the one sample t inference case for a mean. Okay, now we we use different notation to to sort of signify this is paired analysis, but ultimately all the math you already know how to do. It's just we're going to have some slightly new notation. 
So the first thing you need to be able to do for the upcoming material is distinguish between the scenarios describing independent or dependent designs. 